Hello, everybody. Welcome back to PodCanna episode 17. This week, we're joined by Raven to talk Constructed. A lot of big Constructed updates, maybe a new best deck in the metagame or two new best decks. I know Raven has something to say about that. Raven is a competitive card game player, previous caster in Hearthstone. That's how I originally got introduced to you. Um, and then I was able to meet you via Snap um, over the UK when we played a LAN tournament. Uh, I didn't tell Raven at the time, but I had actually watched Raven on Twitch and TV, whatever you want to call it, for years prior to meeting him. So I was, I was a little bit of a fan, but <laughs> yeah, I kept it in. Anyway, Raven. Yeah, I kept that quiet. Yeah, I kept that quiet. <laughs> I just want to save it for when you get on the podcast. Like, oh. But uh, yeah, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Um, and yeah, just, I don't know, I appreciate you, appreciate you joining us. I just want to, uh, can you just, for, to set a foundation, just to lead in, can you talk a little bit about... Um, your recent experience at the tournament, like what kind of tournament did you go to? What sort of, um, what sort of round structure was it? Prize structure, etc. Yeah, sure. So it was, um, a local event to me. So in Manchester, which is where I live, uh, Kawa flew over as he is now, uh, becoming a common factor as Kawa just flies over to play Lord Carden, which is great. Uh, not too far away from me, of course. Uh, we went down and, um, it was 260. It was like a, a casual tournament or, you know, like a local tournament, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, two 16 player pods or brackets, so to speak. Uh, it was as far as I was aware, Swiss and it was a uh, best of three rounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was sorry, three rounds of best of three, right? Which surprised me. I did not realize okay. that until we were there and the lady was telling us the rules. I thought it was just BO one because I sort of had um because the last physical TCG I was I've like watched has been Flesh and Blood, mm-hmm. which obviously you know quite a lot about, Brendan. Uh, and as far as I was aware on that, it is best of one. Yep. So I was kind of I was like, oh, okay, best of three, sure. And one thing that surprised me was um I've organized plenty of tournaments in the past as well. So I understand time is a very crucial factor in all things, but it was best of three. I think it was 50 minute rounds. Mm -hmm. Um, And then of course, uh, I believe Kyle will confirm this because he did uh, this happen to him is that if you pass the timer, you get five turns Mm -hmm. um, from the turn after the one that's finished at that point. Um, And then if no one wins, I believe that's just a draw. Uh, And that's just, uh, uh, it's like one, one to the uh, players. Um, but yeah, the experience was great. I have not played a physical card game um, in a tournament setting for maybe eight years. <laughs> I played in one Magic the Gathering, um, like big sealed, like Grand Prix, uh, many years ago in Liverpool. But outside of that, I've not not played any physical tournaments for a long, long, long time. And uh, it was it made me remember how fun it is to just sit with a group of people and talk about a card game, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's probably win or lose. It was probably my favorite thing about the event. Just hang out, meet people and talk about Lorcana. Yeah. It's great. The, um, so the BO3 structure is actually, they released it in their rule document. Mm. So that, that, um, the rules that you did <clears throat> that you played with there sound pretty consistent with what Ravensburger came out with. One thing to, I want to talk about is actually, um, best of three in Lorcana and how it relates to going to time. Cause one of the most popular decks in the format right now is a hyper control deck. <laughs> and, uh, that mirror, there's pretty much no chance in this universe that you're going to go through three games. Um, and I believe that it works is like, uh, if you win game one, for instance, and then you go to time after that, which is actually going to be the most likely scenario, um, uh, you won't actually finish game two. I believe the player that won the original game does win the match. But if the, you know, the other player ends up winning a match, you go one, one, there is a draw end of turn procedure. It's pretty funny as well. So end of turn procedure it has exists in magic. It used to exist in flesh and blood. It was taken out of flesh and blood specifically because of how logistically painful it can be. So <laughs> there's an idea that you finish a match within 50 minutes and then the last five turns will go. Eh, they will follow a similar sort of speed that all the other turns in the rest of the game did beforehand but that's not what happens players tend to slow down they tend to get a little political although it is against the rules in Lorcana to actually do any sort of politicking yeah quote unquote um, which they, i like a lot sorry yeah. to put in i yeah. i really like that rule but carry on sorry which i want to discuss that rule too uh, but yeah you're technically not allowed to do any politicking asking people to concede etc um, but those, those last five turns can take a long, long, long time. Um, and it, it actually becomes a problem. So if they ever do host like big major tournaments like Grand Prix, like Magic Grand Prix for Lakana, you can see sometimes that the, 
your 50 minute rounds. So you would, let's say you're allocating, you know, for seven rounds a day, you allocate something like six and a half to seven hours. It could be like nine <laughs> because those extra five turns hold the tournament so much. So in, in regards to politicking, um, obviously a bad thing, obviously unpleasant to be on on both sides because you don't want to be dealing with sort of the social pressure of your opponent making you feel like you need to concede or be in a position where you want to be asking somebody that, but you're not comfortable doing it because maybe they're a newer player or maybe you shouldn't be asking for the first place. And then you're kind of trying to, you know, maybe angle shoot them a bit. So it is technically legal in Lorcana. What I will say is that those lines, unless they are extremely articulate in the rules about what is and what is not, uh, what, what constitutes politicking, it becomes very, very much a gray area. <laughs> I would say it, it happens Often, <laughs> often, especially like flesh and blood got rid of the end of end of round um, structure altogether because of that. So in time ends, game's over uh, because basically people politic no matter what, uh, unless they're in like a top eight match or mantra by a judge at that moment. Um, did you guys have any instances where you went to time um, and you weren't able to finish your match? Yes, I did. Uh, funny that you said, yeah, I, I mean, I was joking with the guy I was playing against. I sat down. He was playing Ruby Amethyst. I was playing Ruby Amethyst. And I was like, right, we're going to be here tomorrow. Yeah. That's basically what I said. You know, it, it, it nearly felt like that. And uh, the format was basically uh, best of one. Well, it wasn't best of one, but like it nearly felt like that. I was like, okay, whoever wins this first game is probably going to win this this whole thing. So I had that situation. I lost my first one. Uh, the second game went to time. Uh, and obviously... Again, I just double checked with the with the judge, but yeah, that was the case that the uh, my my opponent won the game. I also had a question for the judge during my third match, mm -hmm. where I won game one, they won game two, and then it went to time on game three. And I said, uh, "Okay, so does it work like by lore? Like if I'm on sixteen lore and they're on ten lore, do I win?" And they're like, "No, it's just flat." Again, I don't know. I mm -hmm. I assume that's in the rules, mm -hmm. but that makes that makes sense to me, right? Like, I, if you start doing it by how much lore then you know once you get to those five turns it's like well i'm just going to quest as much as possible to try and win right so certain i think that's, be that's better that's, at it as well so yeah, there'd yeah, be an yeah. asymmetry on that end and it would like favor it would actually might uh, change deck building which is like wouldn't be the intention of the rule raven um i want to get your thoughts because you talked about you know expecting best of one running into best of three um, I want to get your thoughts on best of three as a format in Lorcana. And then I also want to get your thoughts because this was sort of like your first reintroduction to a paper tournament, your thoughts on scouting and knowing your opponent's archetype in Lorcana for game one so that you can mulligan accordingly. Cause in my opinion, depending on the deck you're on, um, it is overwhelmingly, uh, beneficial to know what your opponent is playing prior to your mulligan. Cause if they're on something like a Amber Amethyst hyper aggro deck, or they're on Amber Ruby uh, Hyper Control. It drastically changes the cards that you might be fishing mm. for in your deck. Uh, your thoughts on those two questions? Yeah, so um, best of three overall, um, I worry because I can see the game being slow at mm. times. Obviously, we have this the first meta of slowness right now uh, uh, with you know the number one deck or whatever. Um, I, I very much like what you mentioned. I, I believe you mentioned about Flesh and Blood, where it's someone shouts out maybe right 10 minutes till the end of the round mm -hmm. after 10 minutes bonk done rounds over none of this like oh well then you have a turn and i have a turn you know i i dislike um uh really over complex rules because i also think that can i mean it happened right i watched it happen in front of me and instantly and these may not be the most hardcore players in the world of course of card games maybe less experienced but there would be instantly, oh, uh, so is, is this turn one? Is this turn zero? <laughs> is, do we add five? Do we have five turns each? Do we, you know, it, it, so many different, and it, do you win by law? Is it just a draw? What does a draw mean? The, you know, there are so many questions, whereas I much prefer kind of what you mentioned where the time's over, done. Um, it's definitely, and I think best of three is good though, because as you mentioned, some games, I mean, I felt a little bit sorry for my first opponent because I beat them in like 2-0 in like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, so we played the third game just to, Kawa walked over as we were playing our third game and I won it and he was like, Oh, how did it go? I was like, yeah, I won a while ago and I think he misunderstood. So well, <laughs> yeah, I think he thought I'd lost, but, um, I think that information is very key 
in the game right now and, and probably will be as you mentioned on the decks and speak about scouting i can tell you something because this was i guess more a lot of players i felt were more casual and just there for a good time no one cared about <laughs> scouting yeah. we were i was waiting on my pod to just you know just relaxing people sat down pulled out their decks sat shuffling them i could just see what colors they were playing two people were just having a fun casual game so i just went over and said oh do, is it okay if I watch just because we had like 20 minutes? So I was like, so, and they were like, yeah, of course, come over. And I was like, okay, if I face you guys, I know I wasn't doing it in a <laughs> scouting way, but yeah. you can't help but see what decks. Yeah. I'm interested in what decks people are going to play. I didn't face any of the people I saw, funnily enough, but it was just one of those things where you can't help but see, right? Yeah. Eyes exist. Um, and it, it, I do think especially from a Hearthstone background, that, which is you know 90% of my card game background, mm -hmm. saying I'm on, you know, Emerald Steel. Before the get, before Mulligans, before, you know, as the decks are being shuffled or whatever, you have to just say, these are my two inks. Mm -hmm. Done. I think that removes so much of the bad feeling mm -hmm. of, because I've heard of this before, and it did happen in Hearthstone yep. as well, funnily enough, in, in like in-person swears. Moyen where... told us a hilarious yeah. story about one where the decks actually leaked before the night before or something. Oh, yes. that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it's rough when, say I go to a tournament on my own, well, I'm getting punished for not having a group of friends. Yeah go to that tournament it's like that sucks so it's like if th things will always happen right like if i was playing and me and Kyle were in the same tournament and i saw this person play like a crazy weird tech and then i saw they were against Kawa, and if i was in the position to speak to Kawa, i'd probably yeah I'd probably just say just so you know mate they're playing this crazy card so just be ready um but if you can at least say the inks right you give the player any player and every player just a little okay, let me prepare myself for what I'm expecting when I hear those two inks um, and at least have a decent mulligan. And it's fair both ways because both players find out the same yeah. information. Yeah. Done. I think that would be, I mean, it doesn't look like it is. I glanced through the rules, I'll be honest, but I didn't read everything in detail. It doesn't like, look like that's the case. Yeah. Uh, but I would love for that to be a rule. I think if I was running just a personal tournament for Lorcana, I would love to just maybe not even have open deck lists, but have open ink lists, <laughs> let's say, and just say, okay, Kawa's on red, purple, you're on blue, green, and you can just be like, oh, okay, interesting. Okay, how do I approach this? What I expect the matchup to be? Because I don't think that takes anything away from the game. I feel like that only adds to each player's strategy, whereas otherwise, you're just doing, well, here's my just general mulligan every single time let's play curve you know yeah. and i think that would add a lot more to the game if it did exist i think it avoids the the feels bad and it, it's it's interesting to use the word scouting because it has scouting has a negative connotation when i say scouting people immediately think like um organized groups organized teams that are actively walking around trying to get an edge but like you said like uh, happened to me when i was uh, doing my locals past week um the person that i played against in my third round was the player that was sitting next to me in my second round and i knew what colors they were on I actually knew yeah, what deck they were on <laughs> because mm. um and you can't not right you yeah. naturally are interested yeah. in just looking around and seeing what people are playing yeah and it it, it definitely it definitely in Lorcanus especially it is um it is just so advantageous that I don't think that in magic you don't get nearly as much of an edge <laughs> like not even close um in flesh and blood they basically have what a system that you were talking about there flesh and blood is different because it has pre-boarding um but basically you reveal your hero first and then after that both players have opportunity to pre-board so effectively sideboard before the best of one of the match mm. I do think Lorcana functions better as a best of three game but I would potentially like to see it implemented where the lore combinations are revealed beforehand because in a competitive tournament i mean i i think that the edge is actually it's it's immense it's more than i've seen in any other card game to to, to potentially know what colors your opponents are on because the, the card pool is so small at this point they suddenly be like oh they're playing for ursula where it's like that's like that that's not that huge of an edge and that, that's what that's usually what scouting is in a game like magic is like oh they're actually playing mm -hmm. this card they're playing this tech card that you should watch out for and yeah i mean that's kind of the nasty side of it but that's just part of card gaming um unfortunately but in lorcana that doesn't really exist there aren't cards like that i mean some, maybe someone could tell you like oh they're playing the the discard two card or whatever in amber and you play around that but um i think that yeah like you said it almost happens inherently that you will just see people around you what colors they're playing in and um, yeah. i think it adds a large advantage and, 
And I think for me, just as a quick example, because of the deck I was playing, I played against a lot of Amber. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, me, if I knew, I didn't know it this beforehand, because like I said, that's the people I played against actually hadn't seen their decks. But if I'd known that, like, I mean, I play Tink in my list, like I play Simba, Mm -hmm. you know, those are big deals because you want to stop the, you know, like the Lilos and the early stuff, you know, I play Jasper as well. So like, whereas those cards are not as strong if I was against Ruby Amethyst, right? Like those cards aren't anywhere near Mm -hmm. as impactful. They're still good cards, but they're not game winning. Whereas, I mean, I'll tell you now, I giant tinked once and just insta won the game Mm -hmm. off the bat because it cleared the board basically. And then it was over. So knowing that, such a combo is so important versus not knowing in the mulligan is you know as you guys know massive yeah it's the most mm-hmm. powerful question card gaming mulligan i've ever seen as well yeah mm-hmm. i have a quick question just in, in regards to rules since we're discussing brendan again i haven't glossed through them too much uh have they specified if there's actually a turn timer or is that so they can't be, no right? there's not a turn timer um basically the way it works and this is how it works in all card games um you are expected to play at a reasonable place uh pace if you are not playing at a reasonable pace basically your opponent has the opportunity to call a judge and have the judge monitor the match for slow play um mm. which is it's honestly a kind of a shitty part about uh, physical card games because that's an uncomfortable experience for both players like maybe your opponent is inexperienced maybe your opponent is actually trying to take you to a draw which is a you know it's not the most ethical thing to do sometimes and it's like it it leads to bad experiences on table that's just a part of the game um and there's really no way to get around that one thing i will say is that if you play on like a feature match or you play in an area where you are actively monitored by a table judge the table judge will actually be usually it's part of their job to monitor the pace of play throughout all the turns so they'll be telling you to sort of active player, make a turn or active player, make a choice and make a decision. Um, and they do that on feature matches to kind of keep the turns like uh, mm-hmm. you know, on a reasonable pace. That, that, so that's how it goes. I want to ask you guys both a question. So Pixelborn, the online emulator for Lorcana, uh, releases its data every single week. All of the color combinations, and this is, uh, except for week four, there's one outlier, but it's for small outlier. All of the color combinations, I mean all of them, I mean even blue-green, they are all within a win rate of a standard deviation of one from 50%. With over 500,000 games played on a weekly, in a week's time, so seven days-ish. Why is that the case? How does the, why does the data look like that? Why does it look so balanced? I want to get your, your theories on why the data is uh, so close to 50% across all lo- uh, in combinations. Do you want to take you can go first rooms? if you want, Kawa? Uh, well, it did surprise me as well that everything is so balanced. Like, I think we, we talked about this probably last week Brandon with Spessy mm-hmm. for how balanced all of these cards are for for set one it really did amaze me I thought we would just find stuff that's absolutely insanely broken and when you look at these decks like Ruby Amethyst Steel Amber and you know Lemon Lime any of these aggro decks okay well these just must be the best decks because these are all the decks that people are talking about well no you look at the data and there's color combinations that you know there's, there's obviously matchups that are that are better against certain things right so like clearly Mm-hmm. Aggro is probably just better against control, right? Like you just stomp them, and Amber Steel is better against Aggro because you just wipe their board. But the fact that we're seeing data like this is it's it's really impressive to me. I, to, to answer your, I'm not even answering your question. To answer your question, I actually don't know. Oh. Like the the game is just so well balanced. Yeah, so that, seems, that, that is an answer. Though. Yeah, the answer is yeah. your answer is is because the game is yeah. is as balanced as the data reflects. Yes, exactly. Okay. Can I ask a question? Well, it doesn't seem like that. Yeah, go ahead. Was this all games played or was this uh, certain ranks from all Pixel Born? It's all games. Hmm. Okay, I'll go a different route. No. Want, Cal. <laughs> I think because all of the cards are available on Pixel Born, you can make any deck you want with any cards that are actually on there. You don't have to acquire them in any way. I think there's a ton of people playing random stuff. And that will naturally create a 50% win rate across, like, I've been trying random things in Pixel Bond because there's no real punish, right? Like, mm-hmm. there is a ranking system, but it's not like anyone's like, oh, you're trash, you're only wood. Or, so, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, <laughs> or at least I've not seen any of that. I would be trash in this discussion as well. Um, but 
I think, don't get me wrong, if we were looking at the top cut, I would love to see, I don't know, top X win rate players, top X percent, what their numbers look like. Because mm. I think there's a lot of people like, oh my God, wait a minute. You can tell, you're saying I can just play Lorcana online? Give me two minutes. Install, go, what's this cool? Oh, these two colors look cool. Play, they play against someone else who's done the same. And those games are kind of just who runs away with the game first, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not saying that's to do with all of it and talking of balance. I do think right now the game does feel balanced, even though there are things I am not a huge fan of, but that's a, a personal style of card game mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or the style within a card game I don't like. But um, I do think the game is balanced, but I think a lot of it is there's just a lot of people that want to play the game, whether they're new or old. I saw so many people at that tournament we were at were, I was speaking to one guy, oh yeah, it's my first card game. Mm -hmm. And he just rocked up to a l local tournament. That's great. But also, they, I knew for a start, I was, pro I felt confident in the match. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And that was before we started. So that's one of those things where I think it's a good reason, but I do think a lot of it is people just testing random stuff because there's no card acquisition. You can test random stuff. And I think that's what makes the client so, so good. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I think the game is balanced, but I don't think it's that balanced. I don't think it's balanced to the extent that everything should be equalizing that close to 50%. Um, I do think that Lorcana is a deceptively simple game. And I actually think that Lorcana is one of the most technically punishing games I've ever played in terms of card games. Um, because it, it does this on multiple axes. So inking the wrong card is very punishing. Playing the wrong card. For instance, I was playing with my partner. Um, we were playing the Ruby. We were playing the Amber, uh, Steel Mirror. And she was playing and she played Captain Hook on turn one. I played Captain Hook on turn two. And she played, Ca she played Prince Eric on, or sorry, Captain Hook one, Captain Hook one, Prince Eric on two. So that Prince Eric is effectively like discarding a card because you can't really quest with it. And it ultimately just gets cleared by the Ariel that comes down on turn three. And then you, you have a tank that maybe comes down turn six or you shift tank on four, et cetera. The Prince Eric actually doesn't get a lot of value. So you effectively just kind of like discard a card. And I think, I don't think a lot of people look at their, look at their hands and look at their ink well in that way, where they kind of consider the opportunity cost of inking certain cards. And I think players play on curve to a fault. Um, and this is even more punishing in things like the control deck and the control mirrors, like which cards you inks are very, very punishing. Uh, but also it has onboard persistent damage, um, which is another aspect that adds a lot of depth to card games. I mean, Hearthstone had it, but if you take an inefficient trade, I mean, it's very, very, very bad. Um, if you pl don't play around specific cards, it's extremely punishing. Like not playing around Rapunzel is such a punt, right? Like, especially if you're in the Amber Steel Mirror, if you allow your, if you give your opponent any opportunity to get value to the Rapunzel when they deny you value by just not questing, not exerting their characters, they will get such a heavy amount of card advantage on you. It's, it's incredible. And that's why things like Cerberus are so powerful. But I think that, yeah, Lorcana, it's like you, you explain the base rules, explain how to play the game, you quest, you get to 20. It's, it all seems simple, but the, the actual sort of foundation or, um, structure of the game is actually very, very punishing. It's, it's rooted in card game fundamentals. And I find that the players that understand fundamentals and are able to get more value out of their cards more often win much, much, much more than they lose. Like this game feels like a game where the better player wins more often than not, which is it kind of sounds like it's the case for all card games. But I feel like if you play a game like Magic the Gathering, you have that like 30 to 40% clip where you could just, you could literally lose to anybody on the opposing deck. Maybe it's a counter deck. Maybe you got land screwed, etc. cetera. Lakana does not feel like that. It, it is relatively high variance because you don't draw a lot of your deck, but the general game plans tend to kind of, your deck tends to do the same thing every single time. And it feels like you have a lot of agency as a player. So now I'm getting back to the original question. I think the reason why the data is like that is because um, I don't think that the general player base is sort of up to that par quite yet. And I think if we took a data set from a large tournament, um, even a small tournament, but you know, no matter what it be a small sample size, we see a drastically different picture. Yeah. I think um, that the things you spoke about, I definitely agree with where the rules of the game or mechanics, let's say maybe are simple to explain, mm -hmm. but the, deci the decision impact is so high. Like I was even like, I quested, in that in that tournament, I think I quested and it was fine, right? It wasn't the best. But I quest as soon as I did it, I was like, 
I've made a huge mistake. Yeah. And all mm. it was was like a Simba that I quested with, you know, it, and it had been on the board for like five turns or something. So it was, I didn't lose because of it, but that's the level that I feel like your decisions uh, impact your game plan, right? If you just quest once when you shouldn't have done, you might have just give your opponent a good trade and then suddenly your whole card behind. And then suddenly now they can quest easier because you, you have less tools to trade. Like you have to think like one little maneuver has such a ripple effect. Like if you give their Simba a good trade and yours doesn't get a good trade, that's huge and things like that. Right. And cards that you even think are, are maybe throwaway cards. Again, Simba's probably a good example, right? It's a one, two. It draws you a card, discards a card. But it's a one to the quest for one, right? It's not going to beat anything up, <laughs> put it that way, right? Mm -hmm. But how you use that Simba is very important to your game plan, even though it's not flashy at that point. It's a one two that kind of just sits there and, and tries to look threatening in it sometimes. But the difference between you utilizing it well and you, and you not feels like it has a huge impact on the outcome of the game, even like getting like one cheeky quest out of it. Maybe when you think it's not going to get traded or removed, it's like, well, suddenly you won law further. And when you have setting up turns where I'm on 12 law, I could win next turn. Having that difference between one law is win or loss. And I think that makes the game simple to explain, which is one of the things I dislike about magic is like trying to explain to a new person mm -hmm. how to play magic. Do you have three years? Um, whereas easy to explain, but really intense and decision heavy is something I like. And considering we're in set one, I think it's a good base of the game to start on and, and build on, let's say. Yeah, yeah. I think a, a good a good comparison, or just following on from your point there, Raven, like I had a game during that tournament where uh, because it was the control, the control matchup, the mirror, the mirror um, I could tell that, okay, there's probably going to be prepared on this turn. Or at least, you know, it's coming to turn seven. I have a pretty decent board. I've been, you know, playing safe enough with my cards that I shouldn't be questing because they can make some trades or whatever. Okay, do I just say, right, he has it and, and quest for, say, four or five? Or do I just let it ride, right? It's even decisions like that where sometimes it's like, right, well, I could just get five out of this. My board could get cleared. If I do it, then they can just make trades anyways. But then I'm still kind of ahead. So it's decisions like that. And that actually really punished me during my one game where if I mm -hmm. did it, I would have been well ahead by so much. You know what I mean? And it, it, it is those decisions that are so it was crucial. Like when we were practicing, I was playing my deck, which I guess we'll get into uh, in a minute, mm -hmm. but I was playing it against uh, Ruby Amethyst, right? I was playing against Kawa. Mm -hmm. And I think early on, right? This was the other week when you, when you visited. Mm -hmm. Early on, I had two Cuscos down and like a Hatter. Mm -hmm. But Kawa had had also characters on board yep. that could trade. Because mm -hmm. Cusco, Cusco's real fear. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? If I hold just one more turn, I'll play this, hold, then I can just go. And then it'll just be prepared. And I was mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, well, I could have quested with my Cuscos. They all die, and they wouldn't have to be prepared. You know, like, that means Kawa stays ahead because yeah. he can trade. But I've just missed, like, a million lore. Yeah. And I think that really impacted me because in this tournament, I was like, you know what? Cusco could die next turn if I quest, but it's three law. That is yeah. a lot. Tap, mm -hmm. go. And like that's I obviously that's deck specific. And but I think those lessons you learn are very, very important on when you need to push, when you need to be safe. Because there are like very high value cards in any given deck, mm -hmm. but you can't just say, I'll never I'll never quest because mm -hmm. you know that keeps them safer. And it's like, well, if they sit there and look pretty all game, they're not getting anything done, right? So I think decisions like that are really important. Yeah, Cusco and Cusco in particular against the Ruby Amethyst matchup, I think just represents 12 lore. Um, and for each three lore that you would you would actually exchange for a be prepared because that card has ward and the other deck can't do mm -hmm. anything about it. Mm -hmm. If they trade into it, they need to trade like a Maui or something where they need to already have board presence. So I think you look at your Cusco's as like 12 lore that your deck should be getting over the course of the game. And you know, in that vein, it seems like it's pretty much incorrect all the time, unless you're going to win the game or you're like ridiculously ahead of the opponent's has no cards to ever commit two Kuzco's to a board. Because each Kuzco asks your opponent, do you have to be prepared? Because they, like you getting three lore out of that is a lot. Because if you assume that they don't be prepared a single Kuzco, which doesn't sound like a lot of value, right? That's one for one. At seven trading down to five, you basically start the game with having to quest for six lore to win the game. And you're playing an aggro deck. Because you assume that all of your Cuscos get 12. Because they that deck literally can't do anything to stop you from questing that card um, without be prepared. Um it's it's one of the reasons why Emerald's like kind of a harder, kind of a hard matchup if they draw that card uh for your deck. Um 
yeah, where was I? So I, yeah, I played, a I played a locals as well. I played Ruby amethyst. Um, and it was, it was interesting. I was particularly, it was, I noticed that there wasn't an issue of card availability, which I expected there to be. It didn't seem like any of the people I was playing against were playing their decks due to card availability. So playing budget decks seems like everybody <laughs> kind of came prepared. Um, I definitely played two people, uh, in my last two rounds that were very experienced in card games, but ultimately none of my matches felt particularly close. One of them was, I was very fa- favorable matching for Ruby Amethyst, but once again, the game just feels so technical. Like I just feel so technical. And if you make a single mistake that the game is, uh, it's just, it's, it's totally over, especially and in the Ruby do, Amethyst. Do you matchup. like that, Brendan? Cause I know, yeah. you, you know, you played tons of flesh and blood, tons of other card games. I've, you know, from Hearthstone, me and Kyle at Snap as well, where things are a little bit different, but, uh, do you, as someone who's as experienced as you, do you like that? It's so punishing on mistakes. Do you think that helps the game or, or pulls it back a little bit? So I love that because it's, it's all, it's, it's, uh, in conjunction with an IP that brings in new players and a rule set that brings in new players and allows them to enjoy the game casually. But I think the game is like actually not casual at all. <laughs> I think that the new players will, once the, once the player base develops a bit more and, you know, the aggregate players get better, I think that a new player coming to Lorcana um, assuming we stayed with set one, which we will not be doing, they would lose just a vast, vast majority of the time. Um, I think that the the sort of skill ceiling and the learning curve is very, very high. It just felt like, and it, it sounds arrogant, but it felt like I was j- running circles around my opponents. Like when I was playing against my Amber Steel opponent, I was playing around the Rapunzel. They were literally just holding them in hand. They're like, why can't I? Every single time I've played this Ruby Amethyst matchup, I've been able to, you know, trade... Um, my 2-3 Ariel into a 2-2 Maleficent that's on Friends on the Other Side and then draw two cards. But then I'm just casting Friends on the Other Side because I know it's like the only way this player gets card advantage on me is if they have two characters on board, they play Stitch, or if they have Rapunzel. Outside of that, I will literally just beat them by attrition. There's absolutely nothing that that can do. Um, and then when I played the Ruby Amethyst matchup, my opponent had pretty solid fundamentals obviously been playing magic for a long time but wasn't aware of like the high-end curve combo so like the high-end curve combo in that deck is um it's elsa so a drop elsa aladdin pocket watch on board shield on board 19 ink in in the in the inkwell so you you basically draw your entire deck you play down the elsa you tap down two things you play down the aladdin uh you give it rush with the pocket watch and attack something you untap it with the shield and attack something again that's an eight war swing out of nowhere in a control matchup that's crazy right. yeah. and and if you don't know about that no. you, you've lost oh, yeah. you've lost that game yeah. like you've just lost right yeah yeah, yeah so it's um and it, it is it is a, in, in that matchup, it is a consistent, cause you draw your entire deck. So like it's, it's, it's one of those things where when, when I play on Pixaborn, I occasionally run into players that know about that. And then we'll get into more when we talk about the deck list. There's also an infinite loop when, if you have a couple befuddles in your deck and then you also have the Mickey, it can, it punishes your opponent for playing anything on the board. The matchup gets super technical. It's actually so technical to the point that, you know, Moyen, who was a grandmaster in Hearthstone. We did a deck tech with him on the podcast and we're all familiar with him. Moyne and I were filming a video where we went into a Ruby Amethyst matchup and we went to a mirror and it lasted about two hours and both players were infinite looping. And we, and it was like, we were just stumped. Like we just couldn't figure it out. It was, it's, I, <laughs> so I probably have, you know, 10, 20 hours in that matchup. I still don't know the optimal way to play it. I wanted to ask you both about this because I have played against Ruby Amethyst a lot, but I am not an enjoyer of that deck. Yeah. So, um, uh, is so let's if i just said to you both now okay there's a tournament tomorrow mm-hmm. every player has ruby amethyst they you, you have to run those inks mm-hmm. is there a build if you're going into a tournament you might run into a few other things but my point is if you go into a tournament and you know you're going to face tons of mirrors which you'd probably do now right mm-hmm. it's a very popular deck is there a way to is there things you could add that shift the, in your favor? Or do you just have to say, we'll play till a, till a round's over and mm-hmm. just go? Is there? Can you run just tons more bombs in the deck? I've seen some people ju- move over. I've seen a lot of different lists, but like Goofies with the evasive to try and do something. I've seen some other slight differences. Do you guys think there's anything specific? Like, do you just play more big stuff where suddenly they really have to keep cycling like dragon fires or something to be able to keep up or they're just going to get run over. Is there some sort of crazy strategy or tech, it, even if it's narrow or is it just 
you play the control and and hope you can outplay your opponent with the same cards, basically. So I think there's some non-negotiable cards uh, that allow you to infinitely loop your deck at the end game, which is you play around three brooms, you play one Mickey Mouse, and you play two Buff Huddles. You need to be careful how you ink those. Outside of that, I do think there are better builds of the deck, and I think the builds of the deck are the ones that are basically giving themselves the equity to win the game in the early and mid game via aggressive questing. Um, and if that doesn't happen, they have an infinite loop control plan and attrition plan. To try As to a backup, them. right? Exactly. So that that is the backup. Um, that's the list that we are playing. And particularly, so you talked about Goofy. We actually run four Pongo. So the the reason why oh, I like Pongo, yeah, sure. the reason why I like Pongo over Goofy is Goofy competes in the five slot, which is where Maui is, and Maui's a great uh, great play for that deck to be making. And the floor slot is relatively open. It competes with like Jafar which is a kind of a bad card um and pongo literally demands the same thing that goofy does technically goofy can trade into it but both pongo and goofy ask the same question to each opponent on both sides which is you have to dragon fire this like you literally mm-hmm. have to yep. target removal mm-hmm. this so if they're playing a goofy and they're they're trading into your pongo like that was already a losing scenario anyway because if they played a goofy and you didn't have a pongo on board you're already dragon firing it anyway mm-hmm. so it's just like it asks the same question but it does it in a mm-hmm. more efficient way it's why mickey mouse brave little taylor is such a bad card in the mirror it looks like this crazy card where it's like you get it down it quests for four lore and it's like this big bomb you put back in your deck but it's actually just terribly inefficient at what it does and your opponent is now trading, dragon fire yeah yeah now they're trading <laughs> like, yeah. five five to your eight and they're trading up <laughs> yeah um yeah, it's, uh, I think Ursula is really good. Uh, Elsa, four Elsas is really good. But Ursula is, is really punishing because Ursula cannot be traded into, basically. Um, especially if you have untap with the, with the shield. Um, your opponent just basically sends a trade into it. Again, has to spot removal and you're just taxing your opponent out of spot removal. And the game, it's an attrition game based around spot removal. Kind of. Because, there's, uh, we'll get into it with the list, but basically there's like this weird chessy, like level kind of end game where your opponent, um, can't like if you land in Ursula, they will now combo you with Elsa plus Mickey Mouse plus the broom plus three pocket watches, run the brooms into you, shuffle mm. their whole graveyard back into their deck, and like they just beat it's it's yeah, it's tough to explain. Um, I want to I want to ans- ask you a more sort of in the same vein if you're going to a tournament and I, I told you that the tournament is going to be I don't know, 50, 60% Ruby Amethyst. What deck would you bring and why? Do you think that, would you be bringing a, a deck to compete in the mirror or would you be bringing a different deck? Do you think Ruby Amethyst has a weakness? I assume this question is to, is to you. Is to you. Mainly because it's, I've played so much of it. Okay. I'm sure this question is to you, Raven. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, I'd bring my Emerald Steel deck. I'd still <laughs> do it. I have beat Ruby Amethyst on Pixel Bond. Again, you never really know the overall quality of, you know, anonymous player on Pixel Bond, right? I would definitely test stuff. Um, I've beaten Kawa. Kawa's beaten me. Um, I actually, I think Moyen was watching me when I was streaming this match, but I played against Ruby Amethyst on Pixel Bond with my list and I beat something like three Dragon Fires and four Be Prepared and I still won. Whether you think that's, um, uh, due to my skill or my opponent's lack of it, I don't know, uh, but it's doable. And for me, I feel like there's enough ways to get, I'll say, like, you know, the, the term is like go under, right? Mm-hmm. If that's even a thing, go under at least the list I've played against. Maybe I'd change a couple of cards if I was, you know, really confident it was going to be the majority just being that deck. But I have no desire to play those mirrors in any way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. I do not want to go for draws. I don't want to mess around with all that. And even though I like a lot of the cards in both uh, uh, you know, purple and red, I just think the combination and the goal of that deck being as controlly as it is just isn't something I enjoy. And I'm very much, as, as Cal found out in Marvel Snap Talent we played in recently, very much a player who likes to play decks I, I like, mm-hmm. right? I, even if it's to my own detriment, right? If it's, oh, you're never going to win the tournament with this list, fine, but I'll have fun playing the deck. And that's always been something for me where I play better if I'm just playing something I like to play, whether it's been Hearthstone, Marvel Snap, Lorcana, whatever. Um, I I rate that higher. Um, that doesn't make me a good competitive player, of course, but it makes me have more fun in, in actually the playing of the game. So I would still bring at the moment emerald steel 100 percent. what uh what archetype do you traditionally gravitate towards i normally lean towards uh aggro uh, mm. i mainly talk about hearthstone here normally lean towards aggro i do like combo styles but i like uh, it sounds stupid but like 
aggressive combos. So there's been decks in Hearthstone where you can cycle your deck quickly, then say on turn seven, eight, or nine, you can pop off with some kind of high damage combo. There's one currently at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are combo decks that you know are more control based, right? Like let's take the Ruby Amethyst for just an easier example. Is you run tons of removal. You you are focusing on not losing the early game, is how I would phrase it. And then you have the ability to pop off in the late game. I would prefer to have a deck that actively tries to get to that late game quickly and then win. Like those are like the combo styles I would like. But generally, um I was happy that the the I would say like aggro style of Emerald um happens to also have some of my favorite characters from from the, the ip as well so that definitely helps but yeah generally aggro like i i would like mo- i have t- how many some like i can't remember now but in over ten thousand wins on hunter in hearthstone okay. for example that's a so lot. that's a lot yeah i've been playing for a while um but yeah so and those are wins by the way not just games played obviously um so there's probably like 30,000 losses, let's be honest. Um, but but yeah, so I prefer aggro overall. I like being the more active player and making my opponent react to me is is generally what I go for. Mm-hmm. Um, hell, I, one more. God, I had a, so you played a lot of Hearthstone, right? I mean, like mm-hmm. you said. Um, do you think that what aspects of Hearthstone, you know, your experience in Hearthstone, sort of transition to in, into Lorcana. Like what fundamentals do you think you brought over that give you an edge? Um, I think the, uh, I'm not the best analyst in the world, right? I'm not, you know, I, I probably design terrible cards, but I think looking at a card and just deciding whether it's good is, is very helpful, at least at this stage, right? Mm-hmm. Because I was, I saw some people playing, um, you know, like more leaning more towards starter decks, right? Altered starter decks or improved starter decks where some cards, I was like, there are f- cards from the starter decks you could play instead of these ones. And they're way better, mm-hmm. even though they don't look it. I think one of the biggest examples, at least to me, is um, Jasper. A lot of the lists I saw weren't playing Jasper. And I'm like, I expect a lot of people to play the sort of aggro sort of style. And Jasper, like, normally two for ones at that point and has an additional effect of causing havoc with any big card that wants to quest right so you have so many i stopped so many stitches that weekend honestly just said no that's not going to quest for three it's fine um but a card like that i saw i i used to have the um oh what's his name Christoph, I think I'm. Mm-hmm. Is it, yeah, that's, that's the three, three, three for two, three right? Three, three, two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I used to have those in, and I took them all out and put Jasper in because yes, it's more law from Christoph, but this is a two four, and a lot of people are playing two twos. This just this just does well and and chips damage. And then when you look at the impact of playing Jasper on three, and then maybe slightly later on having uh, the Tink one damage, because then suddenly Jasper's killing things with three health Mm -hmm. um, with the one damage on, with the permanence, as you mentioned. So I think the ability to, one, look at cards that maybe people don't think are good and realizing they're good before they do, uh, and then also, generally speaking, like I think card advantage is is one thing I learned. I think I beat people that this past weekend and on, on Pixelborn, just because I have solely focused on, wait a minute, they're running out of cards. So I'm playing an Emerald deck that has high law count cards, but if I just trade and kill these two things they have on board, they're basically top decking, and my top decks in this deck are quite good. <laughs> so it's like, if we go into a top deck wall, which I did, it happened once in a major way in that tournament, my top decks are very, very, very good, and they will probably do well against any opponents. So I played the Amber Steel matchup, which was my closest match. It went 2-1. And I purposely brought them down to one card and mm-hmm. then just didn't let them draw more, or didn't let them have the opportunity to draw. I sat on a whole game with a whole new world in hand and mm-hmm. was like, nope, yep. nope, I'm pretty sure I win the top deck war here, so I'm just sat there with this one card every single turn. Um, but then I started dropping the likes of Silver, uh, John Silver, who's an insane card, by the way. I love, that's one of my favorites, too. Um, Hatter, Cusco, even Beast you know, is great to just throw out in that sort of top deck war. Um, and I think, yeah, at, at least at the moment, 
let's see if the game gets more like you know way more card draw in the future but right now if you just are holding more cards than your opponent you are probably winning mm -hmm. is how i would very generally sum up and i, mean, I think the those key card card game mechanics because that's normally true of most card games right mm -hmm. uh really help and you i could almost see just from how each player was just roughly playing even at a glance i could probably point out who had played card games before and who was more mm -hmm. new at that tournament just based on how they were approaching the game so that helped a lot i think that's what I loved about when I played you with the Ruby Amethyst in, in the matchup, because usually if, if we're talking about card advantage, it's like, right, well, I have a crazy draw engine. I should be like, you know, kind of stomping you. But then that card that you were holding the whole time actually does something insane, right? If you, a whole new world, there goes my two be prepared, one of my dragon fires, right? It's just like, well, that's kind of crazy. Like, that's really, really impactful. And yeah, you get a lot of like, you get to redraw, you get to play other cards, but a lot of the removal of the deck that again against Cusco's and stuff it's like well how how do i deal with that now you know what i mean yeah i can i can honestly just dissect the verbiage that you use like um like you say two for one card advantage like those things they seem so natural and simple to you but you would be surprised like people when they first approach a card game like those concepts uh they don't actually make immediate sense to them um and it, or at least they're not immediately apparent so I think one of the biggest issues in card games is that, especially new players, they get, they get caught up in the narrative of the board state, their hand, certain characters on the board, et cetera. And they don't focus on just value, right? Like they don't focus on just two for one in their opponent more than their opponent two for one's in. They get caught up in this, this sort of storyline that's happening on the board, but it's actually not that relevant. It is contextually relevant at the right time. But ultimately, if you just get more value and value is card advantage, value is, um, you know, trade, uh, trading up on your opponent. Like you trade your two drop for their five drop. You do that more often than your opponent. You know, agnostic of any other information in your hand, on your board, your game plan, your deck, anything, you will win more card games than your opponent. And that's what most people miss. Like, mm. you talk about a card there, a whole new world. People, you, on, I remember a long, long time ago, some of you uh, watching my uh, know a name, Life Coach, mm -hmm. uh, great guy, great, uh, you know, card, well, get, great just game player on, on many different aspects, but played Hearthstone for a very long time, was very good at it. I remember sat next to him at an event. And he was talking about a deck and he was adding up the value mm -hmm. of the cards left in the deck. Don't ask me how he, what, how he worked out what numbers he wanted to apply to cards based on whatever, because mm -hmm. that's irrelevant. Because one thing I would explain is like, let's take a look at like, if you look at every card in your deck and say, okay, if I use this card correctly, let's say Jasper two for one. So let's say Jasper's worth two and you know, a, a two, two is worth one because it's likely to just trade the ones. If your total of that, however you want to decide those numbers, if your total is worth more or higher than your opponent's deck based on how they play and you play well, you should win, right? That's like the way to think about it. And the way he was discussing it is like, okay, well, that means I, I have like, you know, 28 left and they, they can't have, they only have about 15. So he was doing who knows what in his brain to work, decide all this. But that theory really stuck with me because I'd never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. I never thought, well, okay. I knew, oh, have I got the good cards left in my deck? Have they got the bad cards? But it's more like, what does this card do? What am I expecting it to do in this game? You talked about earlier about Cusco gets you three law. That's what it's worth. Sometimes it does better. Fantastic. But it gets you three. So you bank three with Cusco. And because it's awkward, it can also take a card away from your opponent in a trade. So mm -hmm. suddenly you're like a trade plus three law. Okay. That's a high value card. And then if it doesn't get that, or if it gets more, you can then judge on how the game's going. And I think things like that, as you said, like fundamentals, what feel natural now. I still remember sitting listening to Life Coach yeah. and thinking, what is he? talking about yeah like, what is he blabbering on about because it made no sense until i asked him and he started to explain stuff i was like okay i don't know where you're getting these numbers from but the idea is completely correct yeah. right like just the value of what you're getting from each card is huge yep and that is uh that is exactly what flesh and blood is so flesh and blood went through a bit of a i don't know cognitive renaissance when 
you know, players exploited that exact feature of quantitatively breaking down a card and then finding a deck that had the highest quantitative index over any other deck and did it the most consistently. And then that broke the game. That is just, that is the game. And now it is frequent verbiage in the game to, oh, I have a, th- I have three for 10. So three cards that exchange for 10 damage. I have two for eight, two cards that exchange for eight damage. And it's like, that is above the fundamental curve in which the game is balanced because the game is actually balanced around two for six. So if you two for eight your opponent, more often than not, you're just getting more value out of your card than you're supposed mm. to and your opponent mm-hmm. does not have cards that can compete with that unless they're playing the same cards and that actually it just flipped the game on its head because flesh and blood is a very mathy game it's it's not like um it's not like magic or even like lorcana where there are some cards that are more powerful than others there's no card in, in flesh and blood that is that kind of is technically objectively more powerful than the other they're just contextually more powerful um because they're all balanced off the same sort of mathematical equation and that's how Fa- flesh and blood is balanced their game in exchange for resources versus damage, etc. But there are some cards that have broken that paradigm, broken that mold, whether it's a conditional, so it's like if you meet X condition, this breaks the mold, if not. But you build an entire deck around getting one to two more points mm. of quantitative value than your opponent, and then you start to realize that this deck just wins every game, and you're like, what the hell? It's playing shit cards, like, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's it's funny, but yeah, what life coach is doing is it, like that actually is what card gaming is. Card gaming is a quantitative exchange of value and it is sort of suppressed on the illusion of like a narrative or a storyline that goes on on the board and like context context matters, but it doesn't matter that much. And if you get too caught up in the context, you find players like new players, like let's say you play Tinkerbell and you have just Tinkerbell on board and they're like, oh shit, Tinkerbell is hard to beat. It's like, a, you know, it can start killing my stuff. And they go, grab your sword, smash your Tinkerbell. A lot of players don't immediately realize that they just two for one themselves. Like they don't. And it's like, that's so natural to us, but it's, it's so critical to card game. And you have to be thinking about that when you're making plays. Like when you play a be prepared, it, when, I, when you play Cusco and you're like, the only way I can deny you from getting three lore on it. From which is effectively stopping you from starting at 12 lore in the game if it goes long enough, is to play Be Prepared. But my Be Prepared costs 7, your Kuzco costs 5, I trade down on 2 ink, but I also trade my most critical card in the deck for a 1 for 1. Yeah. I don't want to do mm-hmm. that, and maybe I kill my own thing on the board, right? Yeah, and you might have your own stuff, right? Exactly. Which again is like, oh. So your Kuzco, <laughs> yeah. that, so usually your Kuzco is going to represent that 3 lore, and then maybe get traded into, which is a great, so Kuzco just gets so much value. If your Kuzco comes down, takes a Be Prepared, that's a win. That's a win for that deck. Um, okay, before we jump into the deck list, I want to ask you, Raven, uh, just your first impressions on some of the new cards. Where do you think the power level is going? Because I think that the power level of the cards we've seen is a little bit somewhat inconsistent with some of the cards that exist in Chapter 1. It looks like it might uh, yeah, it might change the game quite a bit. Yes. Um, obviously, we need to see more cards. I'm a little bit worried that if the power level stays based on what we've seen then there will just be factually better cards, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, like, you would now never... Let's just Simba, just because I'm staring at the picture of it. Mm-hmm. There's a new Simba that's just better in steel, and you're like, right, well, mm-hmm. I guess I'll just throw my Simbas away then, because unless you want to run, like, eight of the similar card. Um, but I do think it's exciting, because, they're, you know, they're adding the, the resist mechanic, Um you know, and they seem to. One thing I really like about the the cards we've seen so far is I feel like they've built a good base to go anywhere, mm-hmm. right? Because these are floodborne, so they're like alternate reality versions, sort of thing. Where oh, this character's now a knight, this character's now the hunter and not the princess, and so on, and so on. Um, and I think that's a cool idea. But the power level, hopefully, some of those were the top end of the power level because if we get much, <laughs> if those are just like a middle level let's say and there's even more powerful things i have two worries one i really don't want the game to get really nutty quickly i like that that you can explain the rules of the game very quickly to someone Mm. um but also i'd be a little bit worried i just hope they've got the cards printed because if they're going to release even more powerful cards and there's going to be a really short supply again then it really will start becoming i know all card games are like pay to win let's pretend you know but mm. if they if they're actually just saying well set one is you know half of the sets now kind of irrelevant because set two is out and there's just better cards but because it's the new set there's none to buy or you know acquire in any reasonable fashion let's say then it's going to start compounding 
the problem that we, people are already struggling to even just get cards from set one, never mind the decks they want. Um, and this is the biggest point of the game, right? Because this is probably the, the most impactful set the game may ever have because it's like doubling the card pool, mm -hmm. which is yeah. the card pool. Well, generally speaking, I imagine will never double again. So it's probably just overall the most impactful set we'll see. But it, I hope that's the top end. I yeah. hope there's a lot more. You know, it looks lower. Like, it looks I saw Winnie the Pooh, and I was like, "Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Purple can have a five-five. That's okay." And then I saw the new—I can't remember the, the stuck. Is it? I'm stuck. Yeah. And yeah, I was yeah. like, "That card seems very strong, and it's a one-cost inkable." Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm scared. I'm scared. Uh, and I, then love... I saw the green one. Yeah. Oh my god! I actually the think the green oh. one is—it's kind of a trap. Like, I don't think it's as good as people think. I think it's fine. But I think Cinderella. I think it's good. Cinderella. The I'm assuming like, there'll be a cheap game. shift. Yeah. Well, Sorry, I'm assuming there's a cheap Cinderella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for the Cinderella, I'm thinking about the. Oh, hang on, the, the bell. bell. No, sorry, the bell, the bell. Yeah, I'm assuming yeah. there'll be a cheap bell because if there's a cheap bell, I think the card's very strong. If yeah, it's not, it and you already. have to like play it normally, let's say, I think it is weaker, but it's still a, a spicy card for Emerald to have. I actually think it's just like a anti uh, control card most of the time because I think. Yeah, I think that card gets removed. It's just like, it's, it obviously gets removed on turn five, but you know, if you shift Bell into a steel deck and then it gets smashed, like you just two for one yourself and you got wrecked. Um, where Cinderella just negates most of the things in the game. <laughs> Cinderella obviously dies to Dragonfire, but Cinderella negates like grab your swords, smash, like any sort of target removal. It wins all combat. Like it's, it's crazy. Like that card is Think about this. Nuts. What if they introduce an item that when you tap it, you, you can pay for it, whatever, the stats mm -hmm. and all that don't matter, whatever. When you tap it, it gives a character resist for a turn. Mm. Think about be that, because then, oof. What, that, what I want is, I want something that allows me to force my opponent to draw cards. Like, I want more of these cards to say, um, to be a bit less specific in their verbiage so that you can use them in more creative ways. Because right now, you mm -hmm. can't make your opponent draw any cards. It actually makes the control mirror pretty annoying, because they have full agency to loop their own deck. Um, unless you have a whole new world. <laughs> um, and I hope they introduce more of those like, kind of um, wacky mechanics. Uh, Cruella, right? You yeah. can actually bounce any cards. You can bounce your own yeah, card you back. Your you can bounce board. your opponent's card yeah. back. Like, that's definitely interesting. Yeah. Um, because in the future, I think bouncing certain cards back to your hat, your own cards back is going to be probably pretty strong. Yeah. We see, Same we saw a hot with, uh... with Merlin as well. The bounce back mm. to the hand. Mm. Mm. I was going to uh, touch on your point you are saying there, Raven, about how you choose kind of different cards, like your own cards and opposing cards. Same way Hans is written, right? So, like, I even had a, a match over the mm -hmm. weekend where someone purposely said, well, I'm going to ping my own card so then I get value out of Rapunzel because mm -hmm. they're playing Amber Steel. Where I'm like, well, that's great. If that card just read, well, it can just deal one to opposing cards. Most people wouldn't question it. Oh, that's fine. It's still a good card, right? But to have the option to actually ping your own stuff, it opens up still... design space oh yeah, exactly as well yeah, yeah. right like, it's yeah, a big yeah. deal and it's something i again i like about the game there's so many um uh things to tune in the design space for the cards because there's just so many little little abilities they can add on like uh it's, it's going to be interesting yeah, yeah in the amber steel mirror um when i'm playing tinkerbell like uh i have a big tank and i kill something and that trigger happens i deny it most of the time Unless I'm killing something, I don't put two damage on something because my opponent will mm -hmm. simply Rapunzel it and draw cards. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of people making mistakes by actively using that trigger. Well, I don't want to talk about deck lists, so I'm mm -hmm. going to pull this up. It's going to be over our faces a bit, but first deck list we're going to talk about is the one that you took to the tournament, Raven. So you just want to sort of take it from the top in terms of like macro game plan. What is this, what is this deck trying to do? Uh, what is it preying on and, and why is it good? Yeah, so the original, I can't, I, I'm, I apologize to whoever originally posted. They, they posted a list similar to this, but I've changed it a good chunk since then. Mm -hmm. I've, I've tweaked a few things, but the view on this list is it's aggro that beats aggro as well, which is I expected a lot of people. I didn't expect people to rock tons of Ruby Amethyst because I just don't think people have the money to buy all those <laughs> cards right now. Um, so I expected more like, oh, play stuff on curve maybe try and rush down i expected a lot of amber because it's just a very straightforward at least at you know the basic deck plus like sort of level you just play stuff maybe jump uh chuck a stitch on there and and just and play it out and try and win so this deck has a lot of good early options cards like flynn 
Cheshire Cat that make it difficult for your opponent to interact with them uh, whilst gaining a lot of law. Uh, Jasper, I touched on a little bit earlier, but again, it's a 2-4. And in, again, these matchups, if Jasper kills two cards and there's that option in certain other matchups where you can stop them questing with certain cards as well, that... If you just stop your opponent getting three law they sh should have got, let's say, mm -hmm. that's the difference in the race. That is a huge difference. So Jasper's in there. There's obviously the Tink into Big Tink. Um, hands, well, two hands for um, for for different reasons. But again, mainly high law. Uh, there's a bit of card draw in there with Mad Hatter. Uh, the whole new worlds uh, have that double-edged sword where if you're behind in cards... Obviously, this deck wants to just kind of throw a lot of stuff on the board and just go, go, go. So it's a good refill. Um, but then also against the, the, um, Ruby Amethyst, mm -hmm. it, they end up with a few cards in hand and that might look like a bad whole new world, but the cards they're holding on to are normally the removal cards or the likes of Aladdin, for example, or Ursula. So if you end up dumping your hand in a whole new world, the cards they have in hand are likely the ones you're the most scared of. So get them out. Yes, they might draw more. But whatever. Um, grab your sword again, Tink plus grab your sword or whatever. Great play. Um, the mother knows best. The more I've played the card, the less I like it. Uninkable cost three in this deck mm -hmm. isn't great. So I was on four. I went all the way down to two. Um, and then honestly, I love Cusco. I love Flynn. But John Silver was yeah. a last minute addition. It's good. Oh my God. That card is busted i ruined multiple people's days in that tournament when they realized the amount of times people said oh it's on it's on play and on quest i was like yes it is yes it is and you can just say like all these cards that quest for high normally aren't super powerful at least early on and it's just like my opponents had like oh quest for three stitches nope you can smack your head into silver that's a five five and even stuff like um Tinkerbells, you can just okay, yeah, headbutt my the, the silver right and lose that trade. You can really cause havoc and not only sort of make your opponent trade badly. Like I think I did it to an aerial as well, like which is amazing. Like oh okay, you you have to attack, you have to hit this silver, and it's a two three going to a five five, which sounds like even though it's a three drop, sounds like a bad like not that big a deal, but it's an aerial. That's a big deal for that deck, right? If that doesn't get to sing that often and you get rid of it, that helps. So for me, the silver won me a couple of games straight up. But yeah, overall, it's you get on board and stop your opponent staying on board. And then worst case, the high law helps you race everything, I would say, except really other emerald decks. I feel like even the... um the the amber steel deck you still have more sort of law per card kind of numbers if that mm. means anything um so yeah that's the general idea beat up on aggro whilst being aggro yourself i mean yeah i mean that the, the great thing about that deck is i'm just even kind of comparing it to the uh, amber steel list and i mean there's only two uninkables and you're playing a deck that's that's this good that there's only well not not just two uninkable cards of it so like obviously your mother knows best and your uh, a whole new world there's when grab your sword. Oh, there's well. grab your sword as yeah. well. Yeah. There's, so there's three. Just, yeah, yeah. There's three. There's three to four probably in each list. But when you're playing that many inkable cards, just like, well, I don't really have to worry about having a bad hand too often. And you even mentioned you you cut some of the nose bests just because. Oh well, if there's a few too many of these, then it can like impact how I'm actually playing the game. But that's why we said like cards like Beast are are so strong and um. Even John Silver, right? You're saying how great the card is. Mm -hmm. Well, I could just ink it if it's. If oh, I, don't I inked it him. I think a couple of times during that tournament because mm. I mul I mulliganed into him. Obviously, mm. I was never really, I never really plan on keeping Silver in my opening hand, even if I think I'm going to be able to like get value in the matchup. You know, I can game two or three, but like if I mulligan into him, it's like. Well, I run a couple more and I have tons of other five drops. Like my turn five is very strong in this mm -hmm. deck. Mm -hmm. It's like. I'll just ink silver because silver and okay, tinks are six. And I did like role play tink a couple of times, but basically the deck goes to five and sometimes six if you have silver, right? But generally you, you stop inking as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. I only ever went to six if I had to play a tink or a silver. Other than that, I was saying I'm staying at five. I'd rather have the cards because mm -hmm. we don't, what does going to higher ink do for me? Unless I exactly whole new world and 
don't sing it, for example. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think the deck felt very smooth. I think once I had, like, grab your sword, whole new world in my hand for a while, which kind of sucked because I didn't have a good... I didn't have anything to do, but I didn't really whiff on the curve that often. I think I might have had one bumpy game where I couldn't get a fifth ink for like a turn or two, but one game out of Mm -hmm. like, I think I played like, I don't know, six or something. So yeah, overall, it's a pretty smooth deck. The deck's not overly complicated as Lorcana decks go or some of the other matchups, but I think it's a good um, base to start with as well because there's no crazy interactions you've got to think of there's no crazy big combos you've got to think of it's just get good cards down punish your opponent for trading them with the likes of flame cheshire so on and then any small dudes they have clear them off any big dudes maybe mother knows best or smash which i gained a lot of respect for that card this tournament i was like wow i thought smash was good i did not respect it it is so strong and people respected me they were like smashing flynn rider so i'd play flynn on two yeah. They'd smash it on three, and I'm like, I, I wish Flynn was still alive, <laughs> but they've just passed their turn three, and That's I get it. to just play something on... I play a Cheshire Cat now. What, you get to smash that? Great, okay, perfect. I play something else, and they're just losing cards. But on the other side, like, my... Because I played against two Amber uh, Steels, like, just being able to, again, words... And I said this to my opponents, because I apologize. Like, words I didn't think I would ever have to say, but <laughs> I smash Ariel... <laughs> um, it's something I uttered. Yeah, that's a, that's a good target. It's a good target for Smash. Like what you talking yeah, about? Yeah, and it was just like because Ariel's the only card I'm overly scared of in that deck at that stage of the game. If they play Ariel on three, I'm like, oh no. Um, but the fact you can just okay, Smash gone. Let's carry on playing because I feel like once that's gone, I'm back to a good game. I go into turns four, turn five, turn six. And I'm looking good. Yeah. Although twice my opponent double grabs your swords me to play my board which was disgusting. And he only did it the first time because I told him that I, Ariel was Sing 5. Which, oh, they didn't again, realize you, it. Okay, can we go slightly off topic just for a second? Because I want to ask you something, Brendan. Uh, You've played tons of in-person card games. Mm-hmm. Do you just, other than general talk like, oh, nice weather we're having today or whatever, mm-hmm. but do you stick to only discussing your own turn oh, or asking your oh. opponent... Um, oh, okay. I read that card. You know, nothing. Or, or do you? I'm not very. Talk well, it, it depends. So, like, there's there's many different settings, right? There's like a local game store, and then there's like a pro tour sure, world championship. Sure. Mm. I definitely like to fuck with my opponents. Uh, I don't try to get them off in terms of like you know <laughs> making the wrong play, but I definitely like to let them know that I know that they have Rapunzel in hand that's just sitting there dead, and they're waiting to trade it. Well, in. do you know what I did? Uh, it was him, a, like, it was a double grab your swords would be pretty good here, and he's like. <laughs> It, it was really upsetting. So I was very ahead. They were on, t- I think they're on turn five. They have an aerial down, but they only had aerial. Mm-hmm. And I had stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I was all over this stuff. And I was sat there going like, we we're just, you know, waiting, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, you know, aerial's really good, isn't it? He was like, yeah, it's good. So I, it's insane that she's single five. And he went, <laughs> oh, yeah. I sing grabs your swords and I play grab your swords and it just wiped my board. I was like, hey. he, he, and then he went, you shouldn't have said anything. I was like, I know, but I, I, I had that block where it's like, well, I like to talk about card games, believe it or not. <laughs> and also I, I think a small part of me, like, I don't want to win because my opponent M- brain fired on something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I kind of just want to have a good game, right? Mm. Like if my opponent, missed lethal sure i would win but i would never feel good about it right you know like that sort of thing so it was just i was just interested how other people thought about this because they literally would have lost excuse me really bad until I mentioned that, oh yeah, Ariel's single five. It's the it's the streamer in you, Raven. It's all the talking you know. do on stream when you're like, oh, this card's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I just like talking about the game, but yeah, I just wondered. But anyway, yeah, yeah. that's the list. Um, I do actually recommend it for if if you are gonna like play on Pixelborn where cards aren't really a big deal to get. Uh, you should give it a try, especially if you're new, because it is fairly straightforward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely I keep it super casual, and then maybe at like a even at a pro tour, I keep it pretty, pretty casual unless it's like a high mm. stakes match. Also, it depends. On oh yeah, if it was like the finals, yeah. then sure. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's uh, we had we had Sasha Markovic on, and I don't know if he'll love that I tell the story, but basically, the first constructed 
big tournament for Flesh and Blood in New Zealand. I was there with him. He was in his top eight match, and it was untimed, and we were playing a fatigue recursive deck um, that uh, was not expected to show up to the tournament. So we, just, we were debuting that deck, and we're, he was playing a match against a... I think it's the current... No, it's the former Australian national champion, Nick Butcher. And they were in this, like, two-and-a-half-hour slog. They're all sorting each other's graveyards, figuring out what cards are left in the deck, etc., and it's like so obvious that Nick has this card called Route in his arsenal. And he's like, he's really playing around it as his win condition. And I remember Sasha and him were like looking at graveyard, looking at graveyard, tanking, thinking. And Sasha has the sort of counter card to Route in his arsenal. And Nick knows this. Nick has been playing around this for like five, <laughs> so six turns. You know that I know that yeah. you know. <laughs> but then after a long tank, like a long tank, Sasha just goes, he goes, Route would be hot. So like he like says it, like, oh, I would lose mm. to Route. And Nick immediately slams the route and immediately plays oh, the card. And then Sasha oh. blows him out, wins the game. <laughs> oh, I think Nick Butcher literally hated him for probably like three, four years. <laughs> that is hilarious. It was just like, oh man, it was hilarious. But this was, this is like OG flesh and blood. Sasha Markovic, um, you guys have both met him actually. Mm-hmm. He's a funny guy. You know, he's one guy, but then when you play him in a card game, he's a he's definitely a different guy. He's a different guy. The demon. <laughs> the dude was angle <laughs> the dude was angle shooting me at a at a hotel lobby in a Magic the Gathering vintage cube in uh in Manchester. And I'm just like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like <laughs> Um All right, I want to talk about a couple other lists, which I sent over to you guys. I just want to gloss over them real quick. Um the first is Ruby Amethyst Control. So that I'm putting up Moyen I Moyen and I's list. There's a deck type coming out, this will be up. The day this podcast is up or the day after. Um, just key things to note. It's correct to play 60 cards, not to play more. Uh, I think that's a huge trap. Then we made some additions to this. So we cut the Jafar, we cut one Gaston, and we added one Mickey Mouse, the four drop that works with the brooms. Um, and then we added one more pocket watch and I think one other card, but those are critical to, uh, in two, two befuddles. So we cut one more card after that. Basically like that, that package of cards allows you to do an infinite loop that doesn't rely on the board state. Um, so you actually can't deck if you have those cards in the other games. So I just want to keep that in mind. Um, Pongo, yeah, like Pongo is better than Goofy, I think. Um, Brave Little Taylor, not a good card to be playing, especially in the mirror. And yeah, when we mulligan with this deck, we mostly mulligan for ink cards. We don't really mulligan for anything else. So we don't really mulligan for like a specific curve or a specific card. Most for ink cards, so it plays 20. The list you're looking at right now, if you're watching on the video version, is playing 22 uninkable cards, which gives you a hypergeometric um, chance of getting seven ink by turn seven. It gives you a 95% chance of doing that if you mulligan correctly, like I talked about. But we went down to 21, which gives you closer to a 97. The other one is 95, sorry. Closer to a 97% to have 7 ink by turn 7, which is what this deck functions off of. Uh, if you're interested in hypergeometric calculations and how they relate to deck building in Lorcana, uh, Frank Karsten, and you can just Google him, uh, wrote an article, and he's like a magic legend for when it comes to math. So yeah, that's th- that's this list. A couple changes, but I think it's funny because we talked last week and we're like, eh, Steel Amber is probably the best deck. Yeah, I think Ruby Amethyst is the best deck for a couple of reasons. Ruby Amethyst can lose to aggro. Um, it's possible. I think in a best two out of three, you are much more favored. So on Pixel Board, you might lose every now and then because you might actually change your mulligan to mulligan for like early curve to, um, to stop their Simba or something like that with your Rafiki. But, um, this deck absolutely dumps on Steel Amber. Like, I don't know. I've tried to play good opponents, people who are skilled with that deck. And I mean, it doesn't feel close at all. Maybe there's some, people who are masters of Steel Amber that can actually win that matchup. And um, I'm sure there's some outlier scenarios where Steel Amber just curves out and, you know, you don't hit your Inca Balls, but very, very favored in Steel Amber, which is the most popular deck right now by uh, by play rate, both in tournaments and on Pixel Barn. So, yeah, if you like Control, this is the best expression of Control that I've, I think I've ever played in a card game. It's like a joy to play if you're into that. <laughs> Uh, Raven's there saying, oh my god. <laughs> He's like, Give me a minute, I need to go and throw up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yo, yo, uh, dude, I think, that, so when I first started playing card games, um, when I first kind of got an introduction, I, I played a little bit of Hearthstone, 
like that was like the first card game I ever played. And I remember being faced with the people playing Control Warrior. This is back when Dr. Boom first came out. And the concept of like what kind of psychological profile it would take for someone to put themselves through that and their opponents, it, you know, th- them and their opponent through that experience. I was like, these people are sociopaths. <laughs> like, this is terrible. I, huh. at, at one stage in the Hearthstone meta when I was casting a Grandmasters, there was a format where you only played one deck well you played one deck and mm-hmm. then you had two it was like a an inbuilt sideboard mm-hmm. it was called specialist yeah, so yeah. You, you played one list but then you could change a few cards but you had to pre-submit and there were control warrior mirrors or bomb warrior mirrors depending on what what stage they went on just for so long <laughs> and they were so pointless and the, then there was a card added a legendary that s- re- swapped your deck with oh, yeah. 10 new cards to mm. add at least on it. And it was just like, at one point we, we actually, the casters here, this is a little bit of extra information. Uh, we got it banned from, uh, you got from, it from banned. submission. Yeah. Oh, we just said, God. it's just, it's because every game was going to fatigue. And the problem is everything up until that point didn't matter because the players were good enough not to like, you know, use all the card draw cards, right? Mm. That, you know, that's a, a sort of a, a noob trap, right? Where mm-hmm. it's like, you play in a control matchup. If you draw your cards quicker, you can play your cards. It's like, no, no, don't draw any cards because then you will mill first, you know, like you, you will, you will uh, mess up. Uh, but because we were top level Hearthstone, right? The players wouldn't make that mistake. And it was just then because Elysiana let you pick it gave you selections of cards and you basically just picked one and they put two off and you deck and you did that five times or, or whatever it did. I can't remember. Um, and it was just like, whoever got the better 10 cards to win the game won. I almost wish you could fast forward to that point of the yeah. game and cast from there. But that's one of the, um, the worries, which I'm glad like, you know, a lot of in-person card games have a uh, time limits on rounds because if not, it would get yeah. You, you couldn't run tournaments. That's Ruby right? Amethyst. You, you, just, you just couldn't run tournaments. Ruby yeah. Amethyst is not a card. Is not a card match. It's a chess match. But there is a there is a chance, which is the card gaming aspect, where someone can run away with the game by getting enough tempo and actually mm-hmm. just winning before mm-hmm. you get to that point. But if you get to the actual end game, it is a hundred percent an attrition based match of chess. That's it. There's no variance. Like you are actually just mm-hmm. shuffling back into your deck. You have full information on what cards your opponent could be playing, etc. Um, and I love it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> uh, the uh, the Hearthstone Grandmasters are really, really good at card games. That's what I've noticed. Because they didn't bleed over into uh, Flesh and Blood at all. Like, I don't know anybody who's a Hearthstone Grandmaster that played Flesh and Blood. But after playing Snap and playing some tournaments in Snap and being exposed to people like Lambie Series, like Moyen, like those players are very, very good at card games. Like, they just don't make mistakes. It, it's pretty mm-hmm. incredible. Like, Moyen is... Just watching Moyen play is pretty is it's it's pretty amazing. Mm. It's actually and the thing is as well, like in Hearthstone as well, they before Grandmasters, there was like majors mm-hmm. every other weekend, right? And because uh, one point they were in person, one point they were online because of COVID or whatever, but there was so much competitive Hearthstone to play. They'd be like competing in big tournaments every weekend. So they were at the point where so it was so much practice and so much data was out there as well mm-hmm. that yeah, some of the Grandmaster players were insane. Like yeah. they're so good that you you just don't know. Like there were some players that just felt like they just couldn't lose, right? You know, like which is very rare in a card game because in the card game you're supposed to be able to just lose mm-hmm. a lot because you look at sixty percent win rate for a deck is very good, right? Mm-hmm. It's very very insanely good. good. So <laughs> th- that's still a forty percent mm-hmm. loss chance, and you're saying that's like one of the best decks in the game. But these players were just like winning and winning and winning, and they're against other good players. It wasn't like oh. They went to a massive Swiss and bumped into a few of the newer, less experienced. Mm. Like, nope, they're playing against other people who have qualified in the exact same way they had to. And yeah, so like the as you said, the likes of Lambie, Moyen, uh, people we've seen you know, recently in other games, uh, really, really scary players. Yeah, no yeah I mean, so I, you you have a sample size on Pixelborn of the deck, right? And it's very small, but like the if you looked at the aggregate Pixelborn data, the Ruby Amethyst. Uh, it actually is the lowest win rate, I think. It's like 49.6. Um, well, I think mine is 77% over like 20 games. Moyen's is 83 or 84 over 80 games or something like that. Like, it's just it's insane. You know what I'd love for there to be? Um, 
like a Grandmaster style format, or at least one of the versions of Grandmasters for Lorcana right now, because I think that would yield very interesting results. Mm-hmm. Where basically the players played a um, a, a, a mini like sixteen person tournament, mm-hmm. but for one every single week for like three or four weeks, because then that would suddenly. Yes, it's not a million game sample size. You always want more. But if you had the caliber player mm-hmm. and you can just say, look, play out a tournament this week and the next week, play out the tournament. Then play out. You can submit different decks or whatever you want, right? Each week. And then you do that for three or four weeks. And I think suddenly you'd really start to get an idea of, okay, is it just Ruby Amethyst all the way down? You know, is that what you are supposed to play, let's say? Are there any counters when you're expecting certain things? Is Steel Amber like actually the best or whatever? And I think when you add the caliber of player, even with the lower sample size, it does feel like it's worth more in a game like this. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I feel like we can make that happen if we found the right sponsors and the right pricing. Hey, <laughs> actually, exactly. and, and and you've got you know I've cast a couple of things yeah. in the past. <laughs> I'm uh, I've done a bit of casting, so if you need a caster, of course, let me know. Yeah, I feel like we can make because th- that would be fascinating. Because right now there's there's like um there's derivatives of that. Like Masters of Lorcana has a Discord where they run, um you know more competitive level tournaments. There's been one Ks that are regional based, right? Run K in Georgia, one K in you know wherever the mm. heck somewhere else. Those are still they're not quite at the level where you know. We're talking, you know, you get like 16 players. Find 16 of the best players you know mm-hmm. and you can get and then jam. And you jam like three, four weeks worth of tournaments. And it's just one tournament because you can prep time and everything. But you run a tournament over a weekend, depending on what format you want to go for. Um, and, and then you do the same next week and yeah. the same next week. Let them adapt if they want to. Let them change decks, of course. And then I feel like after four, because that's how we did it, because then your placement gained you mm-hmm. points. And then your points got you into top for let's say and then so on so on um and i think that over time really led to like wow okay this person got top four every week yeah like, mm-hmm. that's that is information right there isn't it like that is not only respect on the player's ability but also did they bring the same deck every week because then suddenly if they're top four in every single week with this one list and no one's really getting mm-hmm. over that hump with it then that's that's good knowledge to have versus Pixelborn's a little bit of the Wild West. Obviously, yeah. I think you may as well take Pixelborn stats from Moyen from yourselves, you know, and and sort of mush those together as opposed to anyone who's ever played Pixelborn and queued a game, <laughs> which yeah. is obviously a lot of a wider uh, skill it's, uh, array. So. It's interesting too because um, it's like infinitely easier to get sponsorship and prizing for a game like Lorcana than it is like Marvel Snap. Because Marvel Snap, you got to go find like you got to find like some obscure like VPN service, and they're like, oh, you get a thousand viewers, and that's enough for us to you know qual- you know for this to be marketing." But when it comes to Lorcana, even if we're playing on a the digital analog. It is literally like, oh, you, we can have a direct API into your website where people can buy cards and then boom. It's so, yeah. it's so, it's so much the, easier. It's crazy. The LGS These cards like, go here. Yeah, literally. Yeah. The, the, the stores support I've seen because I watch um, uh, a few flesh and blood uh, mm-hmm. YouTubers um, and, uh, and a few other uh, uh, physical card game YouTubers as well. And they always have at least one store support yeah. you know like they always have support like it's oh yeah check out this lgs they've sent me this they've sent me that put forward this put forward that and i think like that is great as well mm-hmm. because not only great for the creator of course to have those access to those things but it well, weirdly enough because of i don't know if it's because it's like this kind of store like um as you can probably tell behind um i, I like paint miniatures as well mm-hmm. and that's very close a lot of the stores that sell miniatures sell card games and do tournaments right and i feel like Maybe that's a unique thing, but if there's a creator or a tournament I watch and it's like, oh, there's this store in the UK, let's say for me, it's like, oh yeah, you know, sponsored by this store. I will almost certainly open up that link, check out what the store sells, check out the price and check out what they've got in stock because you just think, oh, well, they're supporting like a cool thing, right? Yeah. It's not some sort of, it feels like it's not like a faceless corporation sponsor, right? It's this store that you can go to if you wanted to most of the time. And buy the car you see And just go and buy screen. stuff, right? And yeah, and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it is, I think that is something that's special about like, um, I like the, you know, the, the sort of war gaming miniatures stuff, like the uh, physical TCGs, because the stores themselves are so important. I thought it was cool that Lorcana gave them access at 
early, I guess, mm-hmm. to the cards as well to to sell to their their customers. So I think like all that really meshes together to make a, a really strong community for the game. Yeah, it's not like you're just like, oh, here's this VPN service that no one really cares about, but you know, it's the only way we can kind of get a spot. That's like, I mean, I'm, I'm we're kind of going on a tangent now, but like, yeah. it's a big reason why for the snap event that we did in, in the uk recently over the summer was sponsored by community gaming because like they were one of the best people for doing marvel snap tournaments right there was some sort of relation mm-hmm. and for for me it, it makes it so much more it's just so much more important to me to have that kind of relationship with a sponsor because well if i think it's going to work then most people watching because i'm a card gamer and i want to mm-hmm. do these types of things most of these people will probably click on this and at least check it out right and you can, not me- you just... can measure it too where it's like yeah, exactly. a VPN, yeah. it's like hey we have 2000 concurrent viewers this is the exposure we give you and they're actually there will be no metrics like they like even if they had a, sm- a small enough amount of volume where they could look at the day-to-day metrics and see if your your actual stream had an impact on it it's still bad data with an actual store so we not necessarily an lgs but let's say like an lgs plus like someone who has a digital online presence they have large mm-hmm. inventory etc you can actually use the api to their tcg player and like they you can see trackable affiliate sales like and so it, it's not it's no longer a question of like hey support this and we'll get your name out there and you know maybe some people buy stuff it's like no you support you will literally make money you will literally mm-hmm. make money quantifiably mm-hmm. on the back end. You will see data that shows that you have sold cards from this event and you netted it, you ended up breaking even or making money. And that's, that's an infinitely more uh, easier, infinitely easier conversation to have. The only issue right now, because I know a lot of those tournament organizers and the stores, it, yeah. they don't have stock. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, they we can to... sell you a picture yeah. of the Lorcana cards. <laughs> like, uh, you could yeah. use that as a prize. <laughs> a pre order stock for set two. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, it'd be like a pre-order slot for set five, five. at this rate. It's like, yeah, all two, three, four is already sold up. <laughs> oh, yeah, if um, oh, we'll talk about that more, maybe we'll maybe we'll make that happen because I'd be super interested to see how the meta would develop, right? Because we have a yes. concept of what are the best decks, but that would I believe that would change week to week, and then we would start to see an actual best deck start to emerge. But I'm interested if Lorcan is balanced enough that a, if a best deck did emerge. If there is enough room, it's just a small card pool for the meta to actually adapt. Like, you know, week three, people actually start bringing like some aggro deck that we didn't expect mm. right? or something like that. I even think it, it may give the opportunity to see certain cards because I still think we're still early enough in the game, yeah. at least from what I've seen of it, where there are cards that I keep sort of looking at going, wait a minute, why is no one playing this card? I think it's pretty good. I saw, um, oh, I forgot. I was looking at a list. Uh, someone was playing the... The little dude from Hercules, the the little girl Phil? dude, Danny DeVita. Yeah, yeah. Phil. <laughs> Phil. Um, and they were playing him because, yeah, he's a three-one. He doesn't look that great as a support. But they were like, yeah, he's a three-one. He can kill Simba that, because er, <laughs> earlier on, yeah. there's not much that that can yeah that that can deal three. Right? There's no mm-hmm. not many low cost cards that can deal three. And it was the same with the. Uh, Oh god, I'm so rubbish. The the Emerald card also from Hercules, the lady that I can't Meg. Oh Meg. Yeah. It's yeah. the same because Meg's that we thought that we initially yeah. thought that this card yeah. is I, I looked at it and was like, why would you play this? But <laughs> yeah. to be fair, if someone if I say why the hell would you play this? And then they go, It's so I can kill three healths, mm-hmm. like kind of on curve, I'd be like, Okay. Like mm-hmm. whether sense. I disagree or agree that it's a good idea. <laughs> It's it's a logical plan if the likes of Simba, Ariel, whatever get really popular, you just have a three attack on board already, like locked and loaded. Like they can't play Ariel and sing into that turn uh, or you know any given turn without thinking, well, I'm going to make it's like a preloaded smash hit, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, and that, yes, it may not be the best card in the best deck, but when you're thinking about, well, my opponents start playing all these three health things, suddenly a two cost three attack thing, who cares about its health, is going to be quite good. It's like a sort of preloaded removal. And that's why I think some cards are still sort of um under not even underplayed, but maybe not experimented with enough quite yet. Um and again, that sort of format, like multi week separate tournaments, but is where you find week, those cards. Is where you yeah. could go Maybe this week I will try uh, Meg, you know, in, in, in my list maybe and say, this lets me use that to trade up, let's say, and keep the likes of Flynn safer so he can do all the, you know, get laws in, in a safer fashion. 
it might be rubbish, but I think we would see some level of experimentation. Like when I was asking you about Ruby Amethyst, right? Like, could you just play more big dudes? Could you go maybe lean full evasive? Because there's, there's, um, uh, is it float some or jet some? I can't remember. One of those is one evasive. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, one of them. I'm sorry. Uh, there's obviously the Pongos, as you mentioned. The, is there a version of that deck where you play like triple evasives in the list? You know, you play more and, and maybe that does something. Probably not, but I think it's something that the players would definitely look at because I would assume that a good chunk of them would not be like, oh, I'll just play the same list for three weeks. <laughs> because that's just not what we're like, yeah, right? We're going to tinker, right? Yeah, we're going to tinker the, and, the, and mess. The top players will always be trying to improve the lists and trying to get better. I think. Like, well, mm. I mean, yeah, okay, unless this is just the list and nothing can beat it. Yeah, it's literally unbeatable. <laughs> like, they'll always be trying to find a way to improve it. Mm. It'd be so fun to find though, that but... list, though, right before the next set comes out, too. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm so good for a day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway all right um like you said we're on a little bit of a tangent but raven i just want to thank you for coming on the podcast um and i want to give you a chance to shout out um everywhere people can find you and what you're up to these days i don't know if there's any larkana content you want to shout out as well yeah so um i am uh, at raven cast on twitter raven hs on twitch where i mainly stream marvel snap but i've streamed larkana Hearthstone, and then tons of other variety games as well, not just card games. Um, I am actually thinking of doing a video on Lorcana slash Pixelborn uh, on my YouTube, which is at Ravencast again. Uh, so that you know, some Lorcana content online may be popping up from me um, in the near future. Uh, but yeah, just uh, check out my stream or follow on Twitter because I like to talk about many games that definitely include Locana and some other card games as well. And yeah, I think uh, there's at least me, Cower, Speci, Howling, Howling Minds. Mm. I don't know if you want to nip over Brendan or not, but I'm a, actually uh, in Europe <laughs> all of November. <laughs> Well, there you go. Um, well, when's that? Is, ours is not this weekend. It's next weekend. Yeah, I don't think he's coming uh, to this yeah, one. Not, not that. Maybe the next one. Uh, but yeah, th- there's like a big tournament, I'll say, like up to 64 players. Um, Lorcana tournament. The winner gets two boxes. Mm. Second place gets one box as well as, you know, the usual prize, like promo cards and stuff. So that's going to be really exciting because we already know a few very strong players that I listed. There'll no doubt be more because it's grabbing those numbers really quick. And that'll be a, a very interesting test of... You know, that feels more like the weekend we played was a warm-up. This one's going to be the big one. So keep an eye on, you know, my Twitter, Cowers, Twitters, uh, Specy or whoever, um, to, to see how that goes, because uh, that could be pretty hype. Yeah, th- just thanks all for having me. I do appreciate it. I like talking about Locana. <laughs> yeah, Bre- Brendan's just Googling flights right now. See, it's yeah, actually it's like, cheaper for me to it, win these yeah, boxes. It's plus EB for me to come take your boxes and fly back to America. <laughs> do it. <laughs> they're, do they're, it. They're, they're crazy here. Um, um, nah, but I'll, I'll be in... I'll be in around spain all of november uh yeah we'll do some set two stuff for sure for sure because the flesh and blood worlds which you guys you if you like physical card games you should consider popping over for the experience i don't know how far spain or how like you know how much of a pain the ass to be oh here we go he's gonna gonna show us his cards now look at (laughs) oh he's got cards Oh, I, mainly, I mainly played Blitz, but uh but yeah I, i i love watching flesh and blood i think the game is such a different card game to different style to watch because it is that sort of 1v1 fight as opposed to necessarily mm. uh playing other minions even though i played drama um but yeah uh very uh yeah um, very very cool game to watch so i also recommend i like watching flesh and blood because i don't really get much chance to play yeah make an online client even though i know that's everything you are against flesh there is an mr online flesh and blood Do you know about it oh talisha yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a real online client. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's against their core philosophy, but I also think they just don't have the technical capabilities to do it. Um, Legend Story Studios is a funny publisher. They're like this, they're like this, uh, they, they like role play as a small company, you know, like a small indie company, but you know, they have like an internationally successful game. And <laughs> it's just like, yeah, they, they literally swap cardboard for money yeah, yeah. They, on an international level. They're probably not the smallest company in the yeah. world. <laughs> Yeah, they need to. They need to get on that. All right. For people listening, um, deck list in the description as always. Video version of this at YouTube on YouTube at youtube.com slash podcast. I think. Podcana. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I have to do that outro a <laughs> lot. I'm like, uh, podcana. Um, we're all on Twitter, Brendan EPG at Ravencast at Colatech underscore CG. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you enjoy it. Number one thing you can do is leave us a review either on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. 
Um, and yeah, while you're on YouTube, hit that like, subscribe. We've got deck techs coming up. We had deck tech with Moyen doing steel amber. That was a great one. Um, but now we got this Ruby Amethyst list, and I think this one is this one's really good. Uh, and yeah, Moyen is just a fantastic player. I'm, I really appreciate him coming on to do some of those deck techs. And I think Kawa, you might try to do some as well. But anyway, oh, we've got some spicy. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Oh, sweet.